it and how it applies to cell phones or microelectronics or, or what they do has impact on the battery guy, you know, and the battery guy has impact on the display guy, you know, because they have to fit it into a package like this, right? So a lot of modern manufacturing is certainly not one discipline, it's all disciplines. So you should, you know, if you don't take the course, that's fine. Uh, you know, but you should be prepared when you go out as an electrical engineer, a chemical engineer, a mechanical engineer. People are going to ask you to do the other engineering disciplines because they have a product. And products aren't just like, I'm the EE and I stop. You know, and then if you're on a, you're generally on a team. You might be on a team with a, a bio guy, a chemist, you know, certainly a bean counter, or money guy that doesn't understand what you're doing that says don't spend money, right? And then other kind of people, you know, so you be on a team, you have to interact with people. So that's what nanotechnology is, is stuff on the atomic scale. And this is on the atomic scale. Does everybody see that? This is something you hold in your hand. Really, I have applications in here. I'll start the presentation. I'll show you that, you know, nanotechnology is all around. And certainly, you know, you know, I don't know, this week or this month, this year, but you spend a lot of money on nanotechnology. And certainly nanotechnology is or under the guise of nano manufacturing is probably where you spend a lot of your money a year. You know, because it's microelectronics and all those other kind of things. And, you know, it's parts of automobiles and whatnot. You know, a major part of an automobile is the microelectronics and sensors and airbag sensors and all that other kind of stuff. So those things you pay for directly or indirectly, right? Even if you ride a bus, there's microprocessors controlling the engine and stuff like that in there. So that's what we're, I'm trying to get at. So this is take matters to your own hands. At Penn State, we have what's called a capstone semester. So what you would do is you come up to Penn State, and you're there for, in the summer, 12 weeks, or in the spring, for 16 weeks. And you would take six classes consecutively in the day. So the classes, uh, what, what they are, they're six, well, well, I'll introduce myself, I guess, first. I'm getting ahead. So my name's Terry. There's my email address, so you can give me a contact. And there's my phone number at work. And then email's better because it's voicemail, you know, so I'll do that. So, you know, what is nanotechnology? That's what we're looking at now I'm trying to describe. And it's really all kind of engineering disciplines together to make materials. And it's interesting, in some ways, you know, what are the jobs in nanotechnology? And something that might be a tangent of that, I'll show you the jobs. But if you do something like make memory chips, then you're probably really, really good at making displays, even though you don't know it, because it's the same tool set. So nanotechnology, the jobs in nanotechnology, it'd be like the, you're, when you do nanotechnology and take the program, you're, you kind of become like a, a journeyman machinist in a machine shop. So in the machine shop of nanotechnology, what could you make? It really doesn't matter. You make anything like a good machinist. Does everybody see that? So one day you're making for this company, and the next day you're making it for that. But if you're a good guy, you know how to run a lathe and a milling machine and a welder and all that. Other. What can you make? And the answer could be almost anything. Does everybody see that? So that's real cool. If a machinist is working for the automotive industry, and they lay them off, could they work for the biomedical industry and make hips and knees? Why not? Does everybody see that? Or could they go to some other industry? You know, because they could be a good machinist, what could they machine? And the objective is really not that important. It's that they know the skills of how to use the machines to make almost anything, right? That's just the objective. Somebody gives them, you know, the, the detail, the schematic or whatever, and says, make this. And then they're like, okay, that's completely different. I was making something yesterday for Boeing, and tomorrow I'm going to make it for Ford, and the next day I'm going to make it for Subaru. So it doesn't matter what they make. So the jobs are kind of cool because there's a lot of jobs, and you guys should really know this and be prepared for it. And again, not that I'm here to say don't take the program, but lessons in life. You will get laid off, period. You will lose your job or your job went. You have to be prepared and have the skills to go to the next job without losing your house, et cetera. And that's just how it is. So I don't keep up on the social things of life, but I think people have three or four main jobs in their life. I mean, big careers or more. And you should be prepared for that. 
And whatever you do, try to get educated as possible because that education will make the transition into your next life, your next job, a lot easier to do. And I think nanotechnology is a good example of that. So if you would lose your job in one facet of nanotechnology, you could go into another place and, and earn your money in nanotechnology. And I think that's important. So not just nanotechnology. When you're going to classes, make sure you choose your electives well or technical electives so that they could possibly get you a job later on. Because when that day comes, and it will come, you really want to be prepared for that. So that, that's something that you should, uh, should know about. Because you know? I've got kids myself and everything. I'm like, you know, what you're going to school for is, is, you know, it provides a lifestyle for you. And part of that lifestyle is that you're not worried what next year is going to bring. And there's always change in life. You know? So you don't want to be a mailman anymore, right? My mother, when I was growing up, she's like, be a mailman. There's no more mailman, you know? So a lot of jobs, I just can't believe. You know, there's te no telephones in the house and everything like that. You know, 20 years ago, what was normal, a lot of things have changed. You guys don't see that because you're younger. But when you're older, there's always change. You know, so I always talk to my father, what was change? You know, he told me what changed. It's, the world is a different place every 20 years. So you're really prepared, pretty prepared for that, you know? And the science has never changed. You know, you could always use those as a tool, as a job. So that's something you should look at. So we'll talk about the program here uh, and then some questions and answers. So what is nanotechnology and what do you know about it? So I have to ask that. What do you guys know about it? So it's stuff that's 10 to the minus 9 meters. That's the nano word, right? So it's things on the atomic scale. And what do you guys know about it? Does anybody know anything about that? Yes? Uh, I know they use them in like the medical field for like other surgeries. So, so on. Oh, they use it quite a bit in the medical field, and we'll go over stuff in the medical field within the program. And one of the things that they use, well, you know, cells, cells are microns big. So there's all kinds of different cells, and they're different sizes. But if somebody walked up to me and said, give me a ballpark number, like how fast is a car going, I'd say 65 miles an hour. That's wrong, right? Because who knows what a car is going. But 65 miles an hour is a legitimate number, right? But a cell is about 10 microns or so. So if you can make things that are way smaller than that with nanotechnology, then you could probably interface the cells well. So not only can you make you know, things for the medical industry, like certainly they'd have to make some <coughs> scalpels and all that other stuff. And they actually make scalpels that have like capacitors on them and transducers so that they can actually, they have a feel to them. And they can feel how they're cut. So now they have surgeons that might be in a computer and they do things virtually and there's a robot that does the cuts. So the surgeon says, cut from here to here, you know, on your body like on a screen. And he's like, oh no, no, that's wrong. He erases it and goes, this is where the dotted line should be. I like that. Then he says, go, and the scalpel comes down and does the cut in that area. I actually had things like that done. I don't know how literal it was and there was controls on it. I had that LASIK surgery. So they put suction on your eye, and they have like a razor blade come down and cut your eye like a pet top of a pumpkin, and then they pull it off. That's really cool, you know. So then they, they open up your eye like they take the lid off a pumpkin, and then they shoot it with a laser. Then they pull it back down. And then the guy is asking me, he's like, why do you appear to be so nervous? And I'm like, you're cutting my eyeball open, buddy, and you've never seen people nervous before when you're cutting their eyeball up. I was really kind of nervous that day when the guys cut my eyeball in two, you know. But that, that, that's what you would use. And you could also use it for drugs. So I know sometimes people say nanotechnology and they got this picture of robots and all that other stuff, which is not true. But you could do things like form drugs really small. And the drugs you could kind of make like, biology is a lot of like puzzle pieces, lock, lock key and lock kind of thing. That's a, something that's big in the macro idea of biology. What you could do is you can address a drug and coat it with stuff that likes like a Velcro that only sticks to the liver. So it goes through your body, goes around here, goes to your liver, and then it sticks. Because that's where you might need the drug or something. Or likewise, you know, tumors, cancer is different from the rest of your body because it's a tumor, right? It's a different thing. So they might take a drug, coat it with stuff that only sticks to tumors, and then the drug doesn't go to the rest of you. And what, what a cancer drug is generally going to do is kill something, right? Well, you don't want to be killing the rest of you when you're trying to just kill the cancer. So it makes, you know, like the idea of a robot going smartly to an area, certainly that's true. 
but it's more like they put this smart coding on there that it would specifically go to an area. And actually that's something we talk about a lot within the program is cancer delivery drugs and stuff like that. But if you know that, you know how the machinery to work that, look at it, it's kind of amazing that you would use a lot of the same kind of tools or methodology to make a screen for an iPhone. So it provides jobs, long-term jobs kind of stuff. I think that's an, an interesting field. And we actually do things like make cancer drugs, not with the poison in them, but we make the cancer drug thing in our labs. And then you examine them and all that other stuff. They're not activated and have that rude stuff that's inside them. <coughs> we put dummy stuff in, you know, so, but to, you make the, the actual kind of thing. And you can walk right into a company and make that kind of stuff for them. And those drugs that we make in the course, we have labs on, uh, that's why people have survived cancer now than 20 years ago. It's probably one of the biggest leaps in cancer technology is these smart drugs. So we actually make that within the program. So it's really interesting. And if you're an ED, you're like, that's cool. If you're a chemist, that's cool. If you're a bio guy, it's especially cool to you. But, you know, all the disciplines add to that. So you don't have to say, oh, I didn't take bio, so I could never work at a bio company doing cancer research. No, that's probably what you want to do. And out of jobs, just for you guys, where do you think the jobs are going to be in the future and you're paying attention to maybe politics or the news? Medicine is incredibly expensive. You know, and the cures for medicine or to make medicine cheaper, that's where a tremendous amount of jobs are. I mean, high value things in this country are certainly energy and medicine. So if you can get into either one of those, I think, and everybody will always need medicine, right? And there will always be diseases, and there's always a need for energy. So those are really good goals for you to look at for jobs. And certainly this nanotechnology is your foot in the door to a lot of those processes, you know, because that's where you want to be. So, you know, my daughter's in pharmacy, drug discovery. That's because I said, you're my daughter, that's where I want you to be, because that will make you a happy life kind of thing. So, we talk about things in nanotechnology in, in, for her area, and, you know, so that's pretty interesting. We don't comment. So what do you know about it? It's a broad term referring to the manipulation of matter at the atomic scale. It encompasses many scientific disciplines, and it impacts your daily life and certainly the future greatly. So this stuff isn't futuristic or things you don't see and things you don't do. And talking about my daughter just as an application, well, I guess it's up further in the, the presentation, but... I was just using them today. She bought me for Christmas Maui Jim sunglasses. They're three hundred dollars. I'm so afraid to lose them or scratch them or sit on them. She thought she was doing me something good. That's like a curse. But why are they three hundred dollar sunglasses? Because you put them on, you can see really well. They're UV protected and all that other stuff and polarized, and they don't scratch. They have diamond-like coatings on them so that they don't scratch. So they last longer. So I don't know if they're worth $300, but they do have a lot of features in them. And while you can hold them in your hand, they're an, ex they're an excellent example of nanotechnology, right? Because they're nanometer films and different films. So they put hard films on them, diamond-like films, that resist, you know, scratch, etc. so they don't scratch, and that makes them worth a lot of money. They last longer. Maybe and your daughter just wanted you to have some stock. Or stress, <laughs> stress. I mean, I can't believe the receipts and the thing. It's like three hundred forty dollars. No, she probably said this would make Dad look cool. Yeah, you know. That's not she happening. Up. <laughs> you, know, you can dress me up, but you it was can't. Funny, take my, me my uncle got the same thing from his daughter. These are real expensive. Yeah, I'm afraid to lose them. I yeah. mean, they just stay in the car, and I don't take them into the restaurant. There's a cool factor to them, too. Right? Oh, they are cool. I like I like to walk around and say, look at the Maui Jim thing right here. You know, or, or look how I paid too much for my phone. Like a, that silver thing, I routed it out with a pen knife, you know, kind of thing. So. But, you know, those, those uh, products, you know, products that you don't think about are nanotechnology, they are, right? And, and these products, products begets the word, I bought it, right? And I bought it means jobs. So, you know, that's what you're interested in. And they're certainly interesting jobs. So it'd be, I mean, just picture it. I mean, if you were on a design team or whatever, working for iPhones or something, it'd be an interesting job. Does everybody see that? 
Or if you were working in an area that was like making artificial hips and knees, that's what we do in the course. We, we explore that kind of technology. That's really neat that you're making hips and knees, artificial limbs for people. And if you could make a kneecap or a limb or an artificial finger, you know, when somebody's in an accident or jaw or whatever, if you could make that and be part of that team and manufacture those things, and it goes in somebody and they don't get an infection and it lasts for 30 years or whatever, you can be proud of your work. Does everybody see that? And there will always be a demand for that. Does everybody see that? And they're, they're, because of accidents and stuff, cars and whatnot, you know, jaws are uh, replaced quite a bit because of airbags. You know, when there's you know, it's better than, you know, dying in a wreck, but, you know, there's a lot of facial injuries, and so jaws are being replaced quite a bit more since the event uh, with the airbags. That's what I'm told. The students write reports on those things and everything. I have them do projects, and then I assign something like, this group makes a knee, you make a jaw, you make solar cells, you make hydrogen fuel cells, and you make drugs. And then we'll all come back. And then everybody does a really good job. And then I'm like, the punchline is, if you can make solar cells, you can make knees. And if you can make knees, you can make hydrogen fuel cells. And, you can, and if you get laid off, you can go to any place. And they all look like experts, and they are experts in the area because of the foundation training. Not just at Penn State, your foundation training here at Penn Tech. Because when you do, it's real exciting to apply like EE 101 and Chem 101 and Physics 101. Those are the foundations of science, those basic courses. And you apply them every day. You know, the further I go on in my, my education, just as looking at it, the courses that I took, you know, after I had 150 credits or something, I don't use them that much. But the first 20 credits, I use all the time, every day. You know, those are the foundations. So it's like building a house. Those, those you know, sophomore, or uh, freshman and sophomore uh, classes are your foundation for engineering. And you use them quite a bit. If you didn't have them, you wouldn't have your latter skills. So they're, they're really important to use. So I think it's a, a good course for that. So what do you know, what's good, different about nano? So if you would look at gold, so here's a brick of gold. What do you know about it? Well, certainly you can go to a periodic table and look up the resistivity. You could look up the bioreactivity, the melting point. That's all known about gold, right? Does everybody see that? You look on these charts in the chemistry book, and there's gold. And it's different than silver, it's different than titanium, and it has these attributes. And you can take those attributes, whatever they are, like gold, and you can make jewelry out of it. And you probably wouldn't want to do that out of copper, because your finger would turn green. Does everybody see that? So you're like, oh, that's the attributes of gold. I want to use it. It doesn't corrode. It stays shiny. For jewelry, that's what I want to do. Does everybody see that? And that's what everybody knows about gold. So when they want something like jewelry, they go to gold or silver because those are the go or platinum or something. Those are the go-to materials for that application. But it's interesting when you would take gold, titanium or copper, and you take it to the nano scale, you manipulate it so that, and this is what we teach in nano manufacturing, how we process these materials. On a nano scale, gold is different than gold that you know. So gold, you know, like who's buried in Grant's tomb question, what color is gold? Well, it's gold color. It's kind of a silly question. But when it's a nanoscale, if you look at these test tubes over here, when it's on a nanoscale, and it, I don't know if this is all gold. It might be gold and silver, like separate, like the third one might be silver or the fifth one or something. But if you would take metal nanoparticles and you change their diameter, they're actually different colors. That's kind of crazy, but I don't know how useful it is. But you can assume that they're different colors. When you see that, then you would know, certainly by taking the court, that they melt at different temperatures then. Different diameter on a nanoscale pieces of metal are going to melt at different temperatures. So that melting temperature chart that you had in you know, chemistry is not valid anymore. Neither as if I put gold into somebody, what would happen? You'd certainly be able to predict that because people have been doing that for a long time or saw that. But now that it's on a nanoscale, what would that gold do to somebody? Gold actually would be different. Does everybody see that? It would react different and have different applications. So I thought it was interesting, you know, in my background is electrical engineering and applied physics. But, you know, I have this periodic table that I use all the time at material engineering. But now in nanotechnology, there's a periodic table behind that. 
periodic table behind that, and a periodic table behind that. People walk up to you and say, I want you to make these things. You're like, oh, all I have is this periodic table. But when they walk up to me or you in nanotechnology, you're like, not only do I have that periodic table, I have many attributes of gold. There's different flavors of gold. Does everybody see that? It's not just one type of gold. It's all kinds of different types of gold. And how I would take that gold and assemble it, I can get different attributes and different applications. Maybe just an analogy here, just, just to, for your imagination. So say I'm nature, and I'm doing my thing as nature. And I got my base material, and I'm going to call it cellulose. So you guys all know that's the basis of plants and wood, right? Cellulose. So I got cellulose. Now with cellulose, depending on how I pack it, orient it, etc., I can make different wood. So if I have one base material, like cellulose, I can make balsa wood or pine or oak or mahogany. And all those woods would be used for different purposes. Does everybody see that? So now in nanotechnology, somebody walks up to you and says, I want you to build me something. You're like, I could use aluminum to do that, or I could use gold. Well, I'll probably use aluminum. It's a lot cheaper. Does everybody see that? So I, you're able to do things with materials and manipulate them on the atomic scale to do a lot of valuable things for people. Does everybody see that? And these valuable things would be, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, medical things, uh, microelectronics, automotive, you know, aerospace. These things are phenomenal, like coatings on helicopter rotors so they don't wear out the sand. You know, you take them over in the desert, they're going around like this, hitting into the sand, they're, they're being sandblasted, right? And the rotor wears away. So they have to put hard coatings on that. Or putting hard coatings like chrome or chrome derivatives or titanium nitride on drill bits or piston rings or something like that. You know, get more mileage and reduce your friction in automobiles and stuff like that. So there, there's a tremendous amount of application and, and nano is important because it's small. And it shouldn't be dismissed because it's small because it's used in a lot of large applications. But it's on the atomic scale. Does everybody see that? Like sunglasses, right? Hold them in your hand but there's nano layers on them, and those nano layers make them better than just regular sunglasses, right? Or the care that you put them down. So these material properties change quite a bit. So that's really, really interesting. It can be used quite often. And in fact, we, you asked about bio before. What they can do with gold nanoparticles, they could put them in your body at that small scale. And tumors, just as a little story, tumors are like Swiss cheese, and when the cells grow, they grow all funky, and they're porous. But the rest of your body has real tight linings to it, and if you put a small particle in there, it won't embed in it. But gold will, like small gold particles. So they give them to people, kind of like sugarcoat them, we'll just say that for a quick story. Shoot them in there intravenously. They go through your system. Certainly, you probably evacuate most of them. But a lot of them wind up inside the tumor because the tumor has holes in it and the rest of the body doesn't so they just find their way into the holes now you've got a tumor that has gold in it I don't know does that do you any good but what if the gold